It's the end of the week, so it's my usual catch up with Amplify Me co-founder Piers Curran, and we are not going to talk about the Bank of England, and we're not going to talk about the UK exiting recession this morning. Um, we are, in fact, going to talk about something a little bit more sexy for a Friday morning, which is hedge funds, because we get a lot of questions about this from our community from a potential career perspective. So there was some hedge fund news, in fact, this week. The infamous hedge fund manager, Ray Dalio, which I'm sure you might have heard of him, and he founded Bridgewater Associates, who were the biggest and most profitable hedge fund for a long period. Um, we will go into that running order of ranking uh, in a moment. But they had some comments out of their new chief executive, uh, and he's basically overhauled the hedge fund because Ray Dalio has come under some sharp criticism of late. So we'll have a quick look at that, but we're going to use that more of a vehicle to then talk about and explore how hedge funds work. So we'll look at the history of hedge funds. We will look at the different strategies that they use, like equity long short, multi-strat, macro, event-driven, quant, all of these different terms you've probably heard, but we're going to see just how clever Piers is now in terms of his breadth of knowledge. Oh dear. <laughs> and then we'll talk as well, we'll have a bit of fun with it. We'll look at some of the best ever hedge fund trades that they've been. But in the end, we'll also look to tie this back into um, what does a potential career look like in this field and how would you get into it if you were in your early career? All right. So perhaps it makes most sense to talk about the history first to keep yeah. us yeah. yeah, and there's uh, so. Well, here's a. I'm going to have a few little quiz questions for you along the way here, and so <laughs> prepare. Question number one: What year was the first ever hedge fund founded? Ooh. This is the fast response round, by the way. 1927. Ooh. No, so, well, no, 1949. So okay. 1949. So this was a seminal moment for, well, I guess, the, the history of investing, actually, and, and kind of shaped and, and kind of paved the way for what has become now the, the hedge fund industry, which is obviously a giant, giant, giant industry. But there was a, a guy called Alfred Winslow Jones, Okay, 1949, he set up uh, A.W. Jones & Co. And what was unique about this was his style of investment. Well, two things, his style of investing and how he um, uh, how you measured his performance. And that these are the kind of two factors that, that kind of uh, define a hedge fund. Or well, certainly historically, right? So number one is it, it was the strategy. So a hedge fund, the word hedge is talking about hedging, therefore, you know, hedging risk. It should be kind of a, a lower risk style of investing than let's just say buying shares. Okay. Um, so what he did was set up this idea of, right, well, hang on, I could buy some shares in companies that I think are going to go up, and I'm going to offset that by selling and going short other shares of different companies that I think might underperform. And so he invented this long, short, basically it's now the long, short equity strategy, which is the the roots of the hedge fund industry. But the idea is you're hedged um, because you're long something and you're short something else. Okay, so that's where the, hedge, the word hedge fund comes from. Secondly, then it was about because of that sort of hedging off rather than his performance being compared to an underlying benchmark. And this is really what separates asset management and hedge funds. It's how you measure performance. So the asset management world, we measure a fund's performance through a benchmark. So if you're a, I don't know, if you're a UK equity asset manager, then you're running a, a portfolio of UK equities, then your performance will be compared against a benchmark, something like the FTSE 100 index. And you as an asset manager, you'll be expected to, to deliver something called alpha, which is a um, an invest, you know, return on investment that's over and above just the underlying generic index. Okay. And your clients will pay you, the asset manager, to actively manage their money, 
and they're paying you a fee, so they expect you to deliver better returns than, let's just say, them just buying a FTSE 100 tracker. All right, so that's asset management. Now, hedge funds, because they're long and they're short and they're this and they're that, and we'll talk about the different strategies, You can't. there aren't any obvious like index benchmarks, right? So we call this absolute return. And so this was invented by a... You know, Al Alfred Winslow Jones, he said, I'm going to be based on absolute return, which is basically forget any benchmarks. It's just, am I making you any money each year? What's my return on investment each year? Um, so he he kind of kicked off this, this new style. And of course, then it grew into a bit of a beast. Do we know what his background was prior to that? He was. Uh, well, it's a good question. I do know the answer to that. Uh Oh no, I don't actually. I think he was a he was a he was an analyst, um, like a, a stock analyst. Um, so he was trading. Um, I think he was a, from a soci. I want to say a sociology background for some weird reason that sticks in my mind. I don't know why, but um, but he was also a stock analyst. Yeah, because I was going to say bringing that new uh, thesis forward to get investment or capital. He must have had a track record of something. Yeah, to have right. Have confidence to buy into this new approach. Yeah, I'm very creative and very innovative, and basically spawned a whole industry mm. uh, with his one idea. Um, now, I would say that there's a misconception out there about hedge funds because people hear the word hedge fund and they think all they think is like money printing machine. It's just some kind of outperforming phenomenon right but that's completely untrue um so here's your quiz question number two how many hedge funds are there in the us <laughs> today 2024 how many hedge funds are there you see the thing is that i'm so good at now using ai copilot that <laughs> I, I almost preempted your question <laughs> But I've made a typo on the uh, the request. <laughs> User error. Uh, so, like, how many hedge funds are there in the US? Was your question? Yeah, actually registered hedge funds. Um, Ballpark. Five hundred and fifty-eight. Three thousand four hundred and sixty. Yeah. So, like, number one. I mean, I saw that and I was like, "Wow, that's." I, I thought it would be small, actually. So there's way more than you think. But here's the second thing. Uh, on average, 10% of hedge funds fail in their, um, in their, sorry, 10% of hedge funds fail each year. Okay. And generally speaking, 50% or more of funds close after just a few years in operation. Mm -hmm. So the point is most, the majority fail. Um, so it's definitely not a, you're going to start a hedge fund and you're guaranteed to cash, coin it in. Um, this is a high risk, you know, ultra competitive uh, landscape. And most don't make it. So that's number one. Um, is, that, yeah. is that because, and I'm sure we're going to dive into this. So don't, you don't have to go too deep right now. But is that because you need a certain amount of capital to deploy a lot of these strategies and a certain access to a level of technology to execute them? And so therefore, the barrier is almost like a big capital barrier to start up costs to get. Absolutely. It. Absolutely. And, you know, normally these hedge funds will be spin-offs, right? There'll be people mm -hmm. coming out of a more established hedge fund. People or a team will just step out and they'll try and start up on their own. And yeah, it's very capital intensive. Obviously, you've got to, if you want to, if you want to be the best, you've got to attract the best talent. And there's a war for talent at the moment. I mean, salaries in, in the hedge fund space has just gone stratospheric. So the barrier to entry has become even higher in terms of that capital outlay up front. You've got to, you got to be, you know, you got to position yourself in the best areas of town, like in London. You know, you've got to be in Mayfair if you want to be taken seriously. And I mean taken seriously from the point of view of um can I attract the best talent to my fund? Well, you've got to be located in the location, right? And But that's super expensive. You've got to build out all the infrastructure and the IT and all the rest of it, right? And, and then there's actually a lot of regulatory groundwork that needs to be done. 
you know, even to register as a fund before you can start operating, then you've got to, then you've got to start your sales and distribution and marketing engine because you've got to then attract some some capital into the firm to actually then start managing it and trading, right? So there's a huge, uh, I'd say, a pretty steep on ramp that that most kind of fall off. So to be clear, they're not necessarily using their own money, although there will be some. This is about having a reputation, a track record, probably a decade, two decades worth, and therefore people know that you're going to make money consistently, and so. The road, the, the road show is very limited in a sense that they already know who you are. You spin out and you get back. Yeah. So, yes, there's something else called a family office. So you mentioned those words. It's not They might put some money in themselves, but it's not about managing their own money. It's about attracting funds, you know. But if you want to just manage your own money and you've got a lot of it, like enough where you need to employ a team, to actually manage that for you, then that's called a family office, right? There, they don't have any intention of building a hedge fund and attracting outsourced, you know, capital. Um, so that's a family office. A hedge fund is absolutely, yeah. I mean, look, it's definitely a bad track record, of course, because, uh, you know, without that, you're basically dead on arrival. You need some kind of historical track record to be able to go out with your sales and marketing pitch and say, well, look, this is what I've done already. This is why you should put your money with me, right? Um, but then, yeah, it's about trying to grow the assets under management. And ultimately, that's how you get paid, right? It's, you know, it's an AUM game where your pay structure, and I guess, yeah, sorry, something else that back to Alfred Winslow Jones, another thing that he invented was the fee structure for a hedge fund. So he was the one who came up with this two and 20, which is that kind of typical fee structure for a hedge fund, two and 20, meaning that the hedge fund will charge their clients a, a management fee, which is a fixed cost. And that's 2% of the assets under management. Okay. So that goes towards kind of paying for the operation of the business. Then you get 20% of any profits generated. Okay. So that's the two and 20 structure. Alfred Winslow Jones cre invented that. And that's become even to the, even to this day, Although we'll talk about Citadel, where they've kind of veered off that fee structure a little bit, actually. Um, but even to this day, most hedge funds are set up as a kind of two and twenty fee structure. But it's just like a aside, an aside, you know, even if you're not interested in hedge funds per se, because it is difficult to get into hedge funds at a grad level. We'll talk later about that. But there's a whole industry that's kind of spawned up to support hedge funds. So if you're interested in getting into, you know, grad role at an investment bank, for example, then there's a division of the bank that's called prime brokerage. And the prime brokerage division is basically a services provider for the hedge fund industry. And look, a lot of that is helping them with their trade flow and so on. But actually, there's parts of the prime brokerage division that's helping them with getting set up, you know, with the regulatory hurdles that you've got to jump over, uh, and all the rest of it. So yeah, prime brokerage is on the sell side. These big investment banks will have those divisions and, and they're servicing the hedge fund in industry. Yeah, and I guess the other offshoots from a career perspective would be based around technology, technology from an infrastructure perspective, from a software perspective, from a data perspective. And each one of those has its own um, players within those fields that would service the hedge fund community as well. So. Yeah, there's lots of offshoots uh, that you could work in for sure. I mean, I was just looking there. So let's kind of pivot into Ray Dalio because I just saw that Ray Dalio's Bridgewater Associates was originally set up as a family office. Yeah, that is right. And that's well, he, the, so Bridgewater actually, it's going to, it'll have its 50th anniversary next year. So um, Ray. How old is Ray? Well, yeah, exactly. He's in his 70s. Wow. Because he set up, he set up the the fund. Well, it actually wasn't a fund to start with. Um, it actually wasn't even a family office, really. Initially, um, basically, he basically he started this business in a, out of his bed, out of his two bed flat in New York in 1975, and and the business was to provide institutional investment advisory services. Um. Then, so that was 1975. It was in the 1980s, early 80s. He kind of expanded out, kind of take on 
sort of institutional clients and began producing like detailed market research. And his alpha, sorry, his pure alpha. So when he really, the hedge fund part of his story only properly really started in 1991 when he launched his like flagship pure alpha fund, um, which was a straight up, right, give me your capital. I'm going to trade it for you. This is how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to act for the market on a consistent basis. So yeah, pure alpha was born in 1991. Yeah. And pure alpha, which was like the flagship fund at Bridgewater, big losses, the end of 2022, then recorded one of its worst ever years in 2023. So it feels like there's been quite a big significant change at what was yeah. kind of golden boy of the hedge fund community for such a long period. Well, this is it. I mean, basically, so 1991, Pure Alpha launched, okay? And then in the kind of late 90s, he expanded it out to be uh, like a bit more, like going beyond just, he, he kind of specialised in global fixed income to start with and currencies. They were his two asset classes. But in the late 90s, he then moved into commodities and equities and the, the full Monty, basically. Um, and then in 2005, um, he became the global leader. That's where Bridgewater became the biggest hedge fund on the planet. And really then the great financial crisis in 2008, he absolutely nailed it. So further cementing his reputation as the man, the one. And I think after that, um, that was probably in Ray's kind of journey that was his peak. And I think really after that, he kind of started to get distracted, I would say, yeah. and started to kind of go down a different path, which is really what he's focused on today, which is actually uh, writing books and doing kind of, he kind of, he, he's gone on this journey of, um, well, I guess research. So he's written loads of books like, um, the print principles are, are kind of his theme and the changing world order. And he's gone back and kind of analyzed economic history going back over thousands of years with his aim, trying to kind of pick out these debt, ultra long debt cycles, ultra long cycles of, um, you know, dominant um, superpowers and their currency becoming the world's reserve currency and it's and then the subsequent decline of the superpower, right? And he, he's kind of been banging this drum for about a decade that we are at the end of the cycle, or we're approaching the end of the cycle where the US will cease to be the superpower. And but the problem is, from a trading point of view, the decline of a superpower and the rise of the next one to begin the next cycle, that transition can last like 20, 30 years. So therein lies your problem. He might be right, but he hasn't been right yet 10 years into him banging this drum. And he might not be right for another 10 years, right? So from a trade or an investment point of view, it's very fascinating and interesting stuff, but doesn't necessarily really help you today when you're making your decisions about your portfolio. Did you? What about principles then? Did you ever read that book? I read some of it. I, to be honest, I couldn't get through it I don't know. I just, so another thing about his fund and, and a bit like this guy, Bart Deer, who's the new CEO, another quite unique thing about his fund was this culture, mm. which Bart Deer, by the way, is really just, he's kind of doubling down on, but his culture, Ray Dalio's culture was this, you know, um, radical transparency. Thank you. Radical candor, radical transparency, whereby you give feedback let's call it to your colleagues you know completely no holds barred and it's a culture where you tell everyone straight away exactly what you think now historically that may, that generally that was like top down so seen more senior colleagues giving feedback to more junior colleagues and again feedback i mean i think it was a pretty harsh sort of environment to survive in but then is that why they became the best because we keep coming back to you know what makes a good trader and there's that word resilience we've spoken about this many times on this podcast and how do you 
instill resilience into someone and do and do they have any resilience and and maybe maybe this was ray dalio's way of a sifting out those who don't because if you can't take you know harsh criticism and feedback and dust yourself off get back up and perform again well then maybe you haven't got what it takes out there in the marketplace yeah i i see credit in what you're saying however Ray Dalio and his culture was born in 1949. <laughs> the problem Ray Dalio has with his culture, it's now 2024. I think that fundamentally is the problem with that running culture that way. I think probably you're right. There would have been a lot of merit to that way because that would have been the acceptable practice, industry yeah. agnostic in terms of everything that was the way it went in that way. Life was hard. <laughs> and so... so I don't think that flies so much nowadays, and that's why it's come undone a little bit more recently. Plus, you know, as you said, that financial crisis and nailing it and his ego and his popularity and his fame shooting through the roof probably didn't help things. Yeah, look, this is a classic succession yeah. problem. And as soon as he started going off writing his books, you know, he, he stopped, you know, actively you know, running the firm. And I think then things started to, you know, cracks started to appear. They had a really bad year in 2022, 2023. They had the worst year ever or one of the worst years ever. I think they finished down like 8%. They never have down years. They finished down 8%. And this is, and, and the succession plan was Bardia and this other guy were going to be joint CEOs. But at the end of 2022, that Bardia, kind of won the battle. The other guy stepped down. So Bardia is now the number one. The way he's changed the culture, he's, he, I said he's kind of doubled down. He's actually, what he's done is he's, it's still radical candor, but it's more bottom up. So it's basically him saying to junior staff, give honest feedback to your, to your boss. Um, and I'm sorry, that's just absolute nonsense. Well, you can't ask a junior you know, having been a junior and having been a senior, you cannot yeah. ask a junior to be brutally honest and say, tell me the truth, because a junior is never going to tell you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> You're their paymaster. But at the end of the day, think about the client, right? Ultimately, a hedge fund's there for their client, they're to service their client, they're to deliver outsized returns for their client, right? What does the client primarily care about? Primarily, it's return on investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I know that in this day and age, it's not just about return and fine. There's an ethical side to, you know, to the whole sort of investment sort of process. But in the end, you know, will his radical candor bottom up thing, is that relevant? I mean, really, in the end, if they underperform from an investment point of view, it doesn't matter what their culture is they're going to be a declining force. Well, as the culture officer of Amplified Me, I strongly disagree with what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think you, you said earlier that this hedge fund situation we're in now, it's a war for talent. Yeah. And I think that the, I think that the, we'll discuss, you know, True. hedge funds have different strategies they deploy, but what's becoming increasingly more influential is quantum strategies and they will require a certain type of personality i think ray dalio is a dead dinosaur and his culture's dead dinosaur it's like yeah that's why citadel is now bigger more profitable and i just think that it's just a hedge fund that had its day and you know it's time to move over for the renaissance and the the, the other big more tech oriented players so, so if it's if, it, if it's that obvious why is bar dear why is he saying all these things? I mean, if he's well, still one, talking one, about... One of the things he said was, everything has to get rewired. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's like taking a brain and a heart out of a human and then planting a new brain and a new heart. So to me, this is a war for talent for that yeah. premise. I, mean, I think you're right, actually. That, who's he saying that for? Because it's definitely not saying that for the client. Because if I was the client, yeah. I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? Turn that 8% into 8, 18% positive, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I 
I don't care about that. But what he's saying is that that book that's come out that's absolutely like been very bad PR for Ray Dalio and consequently Bridgewater, you know, young people are reading this book, getting to know Bridgewater for the first time, who haven't been part of the financial crisis. Yeah. Don't forget, you and I look back at the financial crisis and it's like, oh yeah, it happened yesterday because we lived it. Yeah. But that was a long time ago and the new talent was not part of that. And so they didn't hear the great calls and all this sort of stuff. All they hear is, it's a bad place to work and I don't want to work there. And I get paid better with a better culture somewhere else. Somewhere like yeah, James, right. for example, would be the absolute opposite. Yeah. Um, so no, it's a fair point. I'll take I'll take your point. Okay. Well, let's see how he gets on. Um, and they're doing well this year because uh, they're up twenty percent year to date, actually. So um, something maybe a, a corner has turned and they've managed to finally get off the Ray Dalio bandwagon and reinvent themselves. Time yeah. will tell. Well, I mean, if you there's a there is a book. It's called The Fund. So if anyone's interested in having a read about that, I think the author's could have uh, remember his first name, Copeland was the surname. But yes, yeah, it's worth the read for some of the uh, behind the curtain situations that have happened at that hedge fund. But look, let's move on and let's talk a little bit then about the the different types of strategies. Because even with um, Bridgewater, I know two of their biggest funds were the Pure Alpha and the All Weather Fund which in themselves are quite different in terms of their thesis, I guess, in, from an investment philosophy. But let's, yeah. let's talk about some of these other areas then, because um, I've got this really cool graphic and it kind of divides the hedge fund industry into strategy. And there's equity long, long short, multi, credit, macro, quant, and event driven. So where do you want to start? Well, yeah, there's lots of, I mean, I, I guess where do I want to start? Let's say you've got a, some cash and your client's giving you some cash. You've got some capital, right? I need to invest it. And it's like, okay, what do I do? And and the problem is, um, I actually don't know how many assets there are, but I know that there's something like 50,000 different assets, financial instruments that you could buy or sell right? 50,000. And it's like, well, where the hell do I even begin? And so a hedge fund will define itself by choosing normally one of these strategies, and there'll be a specialist in a, in a certain strategy. That's normally because the person who's set up that fund has come from another fund who specializes in that strategy. And that's how they've grown up in the industry. And that's where their experience lies. And more importantly, that's where their track record sits and so when they come and set up their fund their track record is born on this strategy so they continue with it so the most popular and the well the original was long short equity long short and this is simply where you're basically scanning the equity horizon you're doing all the analysis and and sometimes you might be sector specific sometimes not but you're going to buy and go long stocks that you like, that you think are going to, going to go up and outperform, and you're going to sell and go short those that you think will underperform, okay? Um, that's it. It's pretty simple. We said that that means you're hedged, and that's where the word hedge fund comes from. So that was the original strategy. I'd say the next kind of most popular is global macro. So this is then thinking about, well, and this is really where Ray Dalio comes in to a degree, right? This is thinking about the economics of it all. Is thinking about, right, how are economies performing? How's the global economy performing? How are the different individual economies within that global system performing? How is it all interconnected? And then there's this thing we, we know from history that the economy kind of, it doesn't grow in a nice, stable, linear way. There's the boom and bust cycle, right? We call it the economic cycle. So you have booms and recessions, and this is where the speed at which the economy is growing or shrinking will vary. And then you need to throw in on top, right, what are the policy setters doing about the current economic situation? What's the government doing? What's the central bank doing? Because their job is to try and smooth out this cycle. They're trying to achieve slow, steady, stable growth, right? But they fail because there's human beings involved. So 
the global macro strategy is about, right, where are we in the cycle? And you basically go back and analyze all the previous cycles and you have a look at how different assets behaved at this part in the cycle. Or more importantly, I should say, how did assets behave, yeah, in the next part of the cycle? And so, right, how did equities behave within the equity space? How did the different sectors perform? Which ones outperformed? Which underperformed? And ultimately, you're saying the pattern's going to repeat. So I'll base my strategy today based off that historic analysis of cycles and how assets performed. So surely that strategy, though, is increasingly more difficult a, going back in the last decade, the invention of new monetary policy tactics, i.e. negative rates, QE, so on. And then B, you have something like COVID, which has never really happened in the modern market since. And so the cycle is the same, yeah. different. Does the historical analysis now pay the same dividend that it used to in that sense? No, because we have just been through the weirdest economic cycle, certainly in living memory, you've probably got to go back to the uh, probably the Second World War to find another scenario that meant the economy just went off on a, you know, weird pattern. So we've had the, the strangest economic cycle in living memory. And so, yes, that's why most hedge funds have performed really poorly over the last couple of years. Um, it's just not panning out the way it normally does. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, global macros had a tough time of it, for sure. Um, but look, it's one of the, it's historically one of the most popular strategies. Yeah, bad phase, but look, it, the, the, this cycle will normalize, right? And, and as COVID gets further in the rearview mirror, well, huh. You would have thought it will normalize and go back to a more normal pattern. We'll, we'll obviously have to wait and see. From a characteristic of the hedge fund manager, is macro then more intellectually challenging against a long short strategy? I uh, I would well ooh, gotta be careful about how I answer that. I think it's a different <laughs> type of intellect. Right. I, I would say, look, George Soros. We got to, We can't. We can't. We can't do a hedge funds kind of podcast without just at least briefly mentioning George Soros, because in a way, he made macro sexy. And like talking about the be the best trades in history. Oh, is this the pound one? Yeah, he's kind of credited with the best trade in history. Oh, right, you can't. You can't tear up like that. And not give it. Give it to us. So what, what was right, the best trade in history? Man? Take yourself back to 1992 okay. so how, how old were you in 1992 nine okay so you were obviously all over this then because you yeah, were... I was following the front page of the uh, FT and my little uh, brokerage account <laughs> basically the UK had joined something called the European exchange rate mechanism mm. which is basically the eurozone version one um, and the UK were in it okay the, the problem was that uh, the UK wasn't performing very well, let's just say. And we were called the, the sick man of Europe. Um, our economy was underperforming, particularly Germany, right? And Germany was booming. And we were stuck in this fixed exchange rate mechanism. Like the Eurozone, we, we had our own currencies still. This was version one. But all the currency exchange rates were fixed, okay? Now, that's a big problem if, your economy is significantly underperforming the other economies in this system. Because one of the ways of, if your economy is underperforming, one of the ways of trying to get out of that is to, you know, cut interest rates, is to stimulate the, 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 the economy. That tends to lead to your currency's value dropping, which is a good thing as long as it doesn't happen too quickly. Um, it can give you a competitive advantage. Um, but if you're in a fixed rate system, you can't do that. You lose that that kind of weapon to kind of get yourself out of trouble, right? And so George Soros um, made a big, big, big bet because at the time, the Bank of England was saying, we are not leaving this exchange rate mechanism. We are sticking with it. And they were trying to raise interest rates aggressively. 
to try and uh, prop up the the whole situation. It became a bit of a mess. But George Soros said, I don't believe you. Or he actually said, you're wrong. You might think you want to stay in it, but this is unsustainable. I bet that you, the UK, are forced to step out of the exchange rate mechanism. And I bet as you do that, your currency's value will collapse. Well, collapse is a bit strong, but go down really sharply. It will recorrect to where it should be, which is much lower. And the UK government were going, no, we're not. We're staying in, we're staying in, we're staying in. And George Soros said, don't believe you. Adding more to the bet, more to the bet, he was shorting the pound. Built up this huge short position. Ultimately, he was right. And it became unbearable and untenable. The UK stepped out. They were forced out. They had to exit. The pound's value dropped sharply. And George Soros made $1 billion profit in a single day. Yeah. This is in 1992. A wow. billion dollars in 92. That I, mean, I don't even know what the equivalent amount is in today's money. But he made a billion dollars in one day. And he and the story goes, he broke the Bank of England. Yeah. Right. And so very famous trade. And this is this is kind of in a way, it's a bit like I'd say this is a hybrid between two strategies. It's macro mm -hmm. where you're saying, right, I'm looking at the differential between two different countries and I'm making a bet that the exchange rate between the two currencies is incorrectly valued. And I think it's going to move. Right. You could also argue it's a bit of an event driven strategy in a sense. Um, so I'm kind of just briefly coming on to a different strategy here. Event-driven typically is about buying assets that you think are mispriced, where there's an event that's about to happen where you think the value of that asset is now going to correct and change. The typical stuff is like around M&A deals, where if, I don't know, let's say, for example, off the back of you and Stephen's uh, deal room podcast talking about BHP, um, you know, bidding for Anglo America. So you might get a fund, a hedge fund might take a stance here. So they'll, so basically at the moment, that first offer is, has been rejected by Anglo America, right? So what do you do here as a hedge fund? Do you buy Anglo America shares because you think there'll be a improved offer tabled at some point in the future? which will mean that the share price goes up even further. That's one event-driven play. You could think the opposite, because look, Anglo's share price has gone up a bit here to price in some kind of potential deal. You might think that actually the deal will never happen, in which case this bump up in the share price is mis misvalued and you might be going short, right? So there are actually two opposite trades in this same event situation, but both are event-driven trades, right? George Soros, in a way, it was an event driven where he thought there's a mispricing, an event is going to happen that will see the price recorrect. And I want to profit from that correction. Yeah, within that event category, I was just looking, there's activist, opportunistic, and merger. Right. Kind of fits in as you described. In that yeah. Moment. Okay, activist, that's an interesting. So talking about activist investors who will take up a large stake in a company. Then they will kind of go on, get a seat on the board, actively trying to turn that business around and therefore have a more hands-on role in lifting the, the, the assets value higher. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Um, another strategy then, market neutral, or sometimes called relative value. But market neutral is a bit like long short, but with a difference. So market neutral is where you're taking up long and short positions. Um, normally you're here, you're sticking, let's talk about equities. Normally you're talking about one sector now. You're within a sector um, and you know, you're long Apple and short Nokia would be one of the best sort of kind of market neutral trades in my lifetime. So if you go back to the early noughties when Nokia were, were booming and dominant in terms of the hand, handset, um, telephone handset industry but then apple's iphone came along and just steamrolled them out of business almost right so you would be short nokia long apple mid noughties that would be your market neutral play now market neutral means it has to your net you need to be long the same amount of apple as you are short uh nokia 
basically. So your net market exposure is zero. Um, so this is a market neutral strategy. Um, others, uh, maybe we only need to do one more to be honest. Well, maybe some others, but then there's quant, which is of course now become a dominant thing. And what I would say about quantitative strategies, quant really, to be honest, has fed into all of these strategies. So whilst you could argue it's one single strategy on its own, which it is when you consider things like high frequency trading, that's kind of within the quant sphere, um, which is really about speed. And actually, I remember when I was trading, this goes way back, when I was trading in like 2004, I remember the firm I was trading for decided to try and set up a high frequency trading team. And basically, they took the head of IT. So that was the guy who was in charge of the, the computers, <laughs> like literally, and put him in charge, said, right, build us a, an IT infrastructure, hire some PhD students, and let's go. We're going to have a go at this high-frequency game. Poured a huge amount, like millions, into this initiative, ultimately failed and disbanded the group, you know, two, three years later. Um, but look, high frequency goes back to, yeah, that, that was like 2004. So it's been around for a long time, but that's more of a speed game, speed of execution. Okay. But quant. Yeah. I mean, look, and, and AI, let's just say, and actually um, Bridgewater are trialing a new strategy, which is purely using AI. Now, they've given no more detail than that. So what that even means, I don't know. Uh, but they're basically saying 100% of the decision-making for this small spin-off experimental fund, 100% of the decision-making will be made by non-humans, and it'll be AI entirely. So they're experimenting with whatever that means. Um, but quant, like, you know, the whole industry, in fact, the whole world, right? Um quantitative methods are coming in to improve and optimize um, mm. our analysis techniques uh, and ultimately make better investment decisions. Yeah, so on, on that exact point, two of the biggest areas, subsets within quant. One is quant macro trading. So you mentioned before about looking at GDP, inflation, right. to predict economies. The idea on the quantitative addition into this is that then you can just kind of look at massive data sets to yeah. try and find and using mathematical modeling to predict these macroeconomic trends. So it's kind of like putting your macro analysis on steroids using technology and data. And then the second biggest area is something called CTA, which is Commodity Trading Advisor. And the difference between quant macro <clears throat> this is looking at, as I said, the macro economy, using information to enhance that decision making. CTA is more about quant analysis, statistical modeling, and this is all to create algorithms to make trading decisions. Yeah. Now, that's actually the biggest quant area. So if we're looking at the year to date performance, just having a quick look on 2024. So <clears throat> overall AUM for quant is just shy of 400 billion and CTA is 121 billion. So a significant portion of that. Second is quant macro of 106. So yeah, between those two strategies sat within quant, they dominate really. But it's interesting because I was looking at the quant global macro compared to quant macro year to date percentage performance. So traditional global macro is up 2.9%. Quant macro is up 12.1%. Right. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because you think yeah. about what's happened so far this year. There's been this real big behavioral shift from we're going to cut seven times, we're going to cut once. And there's this big kind of shift and the, the behavioral nature of us as investors leaning too far in, pulling too far out in terms of our perception of this change. Whereas I guess the benefit of the addition of quantitative methods is to stabilize some of that normal behavioral, um, I guess, impulse. Yeah. And I think the human has failed here because, again, it's back to that point. We look back at previous cycles, right? And our just 
our nature is to assume these cycles repeat. And so here we were at the end of 2023 going, well, look, look at the data. Last time it was all like this. We we basically had a recession. So a recession's coming. Look, the Fed are going to have to cut. And look, the Fed told us they were going to cut as well, by the way. Um, and obviously that's all been fantasy land and, and not reality. And, and it looks like these quant models who don't care about the history as much and they're not obviously the behavioral side's not there so they're just spewing out the data and the data says no the data says hang on we're not in a recession we're not going to have a recession and so they they were yeah better place to uh, i guess call predict this this development where we've got a much stronger us economy than anybody than any human was uh, expecting okay one more then before we talk about the career side yeah is, uh, have we talked about multi-strat, which is actually the second biggest on AUM in the in the hedge fund industry? Yeah, and this is um so multi-strat, and and I guess here we have to talk about Citadel, of course, because um, unfortunately for Bridgewater, uh, Citadel have now overtaken them, and and actually by a huge distance, to be honest, and are now the biggest hedge fund in the world. So Ray Dalio has been superseded by Ken Griffin. Um, so Griffin, he started his Citadel fund in 1987. Or oh, sorry. Um, well, yeah, well, he started trading out of, <laughs> out of his dorm room as a 19-year-old at Harvard University. So he's kind of started, he started his own brokerage account, but he actually founded Citadel, the business, the hedge fund in 1990. Um, anyway... Um, he's grown it and it's, it's now, so he, and I, my, my data is slightly out of date. I couldn't get anything. You might be able to help here, but I know that in 2023, um, Citadel's assets under management were about $340 billion, making them the number one, the biggest hedge fund on the planet. Bridgewater is still number two, but they're at 200 billion. So not only has Citadel overtaken them, they've now just become miles ahead as the, as the leader. Um, but they've brought to the fore this multi-strategy idea. You've got others on their coattails trying to replicate it, like Millennium, um, for example. But this multi-strategy is it's kind of basically, let's not be specialists in one strategy. Let's basically do what? Do everything. And the idea here is that it's more you're, you've got a therefore a more diversified set of strategies that you're running, so that you're not vulnerable in any one particular. Year. Like let's say in 2023, if you were running a macro global macro fund, almost impossible to make any money because it was so hard to pick, and there were some ups and downs and pivots, and that's why Bridgewater's, you know, pure fund ultimately failed, right? So 2022 and 2023, really difficult for macro, but it's fine. Yes, Citadel do macro, they do, but then they do long short and they do market neutral and they do event driven and they're, they're doing all different asset classes. And so it's a more diversified set of approaches. I'd say Citadel, particularly within their multi-strategy, you'd probably say relative value and macro are probably the two dominant, but also with a big, strong overlaid theme of quant, you know, being the driving force behind all everything that they do. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's really come to the fore as now one of the biggest, if not the biggest category. So let's talk about Citadel a little bit more, because that is someone that we work with quite closely and we know their kind of hiring and training of their interns and new new starters so yeah. talk through then what what would be the different type of streams that students could go into at somewhere like citadel yeah so citadel well so they're the biggest hedge fund right so they are therefore really by definition the biggest employer at a graduate level and so they do run this thing called discover programs which is basically a spring week the, the banks might call it a spring week or they'll call it discover, which is like a couple of days when you're in your first or second year at university. All right. Which is your, it's your first dip your toe in, come and come and meet us. Sit at, you know, they'll, you've got to apply for this, right? So Citadel will be screening all the CVs and whatever, and they'll choose 
what they think are the best candidates. And then I'll, I'll invite like a hundred of them to the New York office, a uh, hundred, right. Come on down to the London office, wherever, whichever region. Right. So really Citadel are employing in New York. They're employing in uh, Chicago. They're employing a bit more in Miami specifically now. And then it's London. Um, it's Hong Kong. It's Sydney. Then we're getting a bit more now in Paris, for example. So they're branching out a little bit, but they run these discover two day events in your first year or second year. Then if you do well there, or if you separately apply, they'll run a summer intern program. So we're going out to uh, Miami in, well, start of June actually, for the start of the US's summer intern program. Well, on the Citadel, the hedge fund side, because there's Citadel Securities as well, which is also owned by Ken Griffin, which is actually, that's not a hedge fund, that's a market maker. So that's entirely separate here. Just Citadel, the hedge fund, they'll have about 150 summer interns um, begin their program. And typically they're across five different streams. So you'll have software engineers. So they're your computer science students, your coders, your programmers. You'll have quant research. So that's more your kind of math whiz kids um, building models, taking in data, you know, conceptually coming up with the, the 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 methodology. Then the software engineers will go away and code it all and build the build the model and, and, the, and the system, right? So that's the kind of techie stuff. Then you'll have the more traditional equity um, traders, or they have this division called GFI, um, which is global fixed income, uh, which actually don't just trade fixed income, believe it or not. But um, there they trade relative value strategies where they're long and short, different bond durations and, and so on. So that's more a bit more traditional where they're looking for people who, who have maybe done finance and economics and uh, you know are really on top of the global macro situation. And they're more kind of human traders, if you like. Um, and then finally, they have this enterprise stream, which is everything else, support functions. So it's risk management, you know, it's whatever, it's HR, it's operations, that kind of stuff. So they are recruiting and there's a space, there's about 25 of them on the summer intern program for the support functions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the system. But the issue is that's the biggest player. And fine, they're akin, equivalent to a, an investment bank, the big investment banks in terms of the number of people they're employing. The issue is that the size of these firms, you know, they do drop quite sharply once you start going down the list. I mean, Citadel, at, well, it'll be more than 340 billion now. That was the 2023 figure. Um, Bridgewater, 200 billion. Then you've got someone called AQR Capital Management, um, 120 billion. DE Shaw, 109 billion. You've got Renaissance Technologies, um, Jim Simmons. I mean, he launched in 1982 and he was a mathematician. So he was kind of very much, uh, I guess, a trailblazer for the kind of mathematical quant style of, of doing things. You've got two Sigma at 70 billion and so on, right? But my point is that as you go down this list, they become much smaller. Therefore, they're hiring a lot less people. So it is, I guess, the... the number of jobs available at a grad level within the hedge fund space is dramatically lower than the number of jobs available at a grad level in, in the investment banking space or the accounting big four or you know just having a quick look so citadel has as of 2022 so it's probably gone up circa three thousand employees i yeah. think j well i know jp morgan has 45,000 people who just work in their technology division. <laughs> um, and Renaissance Technologies, who's one of the biggest hedge funds in terms of AUM, of performance, yeah. sophistication, they have 310 employees. Yep. <laughs> so they were all about the sort of quant and, and sort of computer-led right. strategy right from the beginning, day one. Yeah. Right. So here, here it fundamentally for those who you know completely new to this, the big difference. Whereas on a you go on to a a city trading floor, i.e. Citigroup, and there'll be a trading floor of two hundred and fifty 
um, sales people, essentially, traders, who are on the phone, talking to clients, facilitating flow, getting a little clip on each trade. Whereas at Renaissance, they're doing huge sums of money here, but it's almost yeah. entirely automated. It depends what you want to do as a business strategy, right? I think Jim Simmons purposely has run a very lean ship. What that means is his assets under management has grown at a slower rate than Citadel's. So what do you want? Do you want more and more and more assets under management? That's your play. That's your strategy. Well, fine. You're going to have to build out a workforce that can get out there and market and sales and all the rest of it. Or do you are you content running only 100 billion? Um, and actually, the, the guy back to where we started with Bridgewater, interestingly, so the new the CEO, um, Bardia, he did actually say, and I've got a quote here, which I'm going to dig out quickly, with the pure alpha fund, he basically said, look, it's got a bit too big in terms of, because I think it was a 90 billion at one point. Um, it's Oh, sorry, it was 80 billion, right? And he said, look, it's got a bit too big and unwieldy. So he said that we are specifically going to now cut that down to 50 or to 60 billion. And his quote was, we want to be the best, not the biggest. That's because you can't be the biggest anymore, mate. <laughs> that is such, that's laughable. <laughs> See ya. Uh... Um, I bet Ken Griffin's sitting there sucking his like uh, coconut on his Miami beachfront house. <laughs> so, so look, back, back to the, look, if you want a job in the hedge fund space, they mainly recruit mm -hmm. computer science and like maths and, and STEM students or specifically PhDs, right? Um, then there are less but they exist, but less roles available if you're just, a, you know, finance, economics, you know, the macro guy. You know, they are available, but there's a lot less of them. So it's it's hard to get in um, at a grad level to these firms. So at a non-grad level, let's say I've been an analyst for three years, two years. I'm now an associate working at a US bulge bracket bank in a trading seat. That used to be quite a traditional pivot going from yeah. so that into a hedge fund. Does that still exist to your knowledge? It does. So, yes, a lot of hedge funds, not not the citadels, I don't think. So more about the quant. Or well, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But um, normally the, the pathway into a hedge fund would be, right, go and get some experience on the sell side. You know, I had a friend, a um, good friend of mine, who was a equity research analyst at UBS. Um, so there you're learning about obviously deep dive analyzing companies, modeling out their valuations and then saying, right, hang on. I think this company is worth X, but its share price is currently undervaluing it in my opinion. Therefore, I'm going to issue a buy recommendation. And that research gets packaged and sold to the buy side. Okay. Well, you've basically, there's only one more step needed as a hedge fund trader. That's to then actually buy the shares, right? So they'll poach these equity research analysts, come and sit on our trading desk, do exactly the same procedure. You're analyzing businesses, finding companies that are undervalued, but then actually just go ahead and take the risk as well. So go ahead and buy the shares. So that would be a historically a typical way into the hedge fund side. Mm -hmm. Um and I think that does still exist, but wasn't it Mifid that changed the rules around um, the way that sell side research was distributed? Because it used to just fly around desks right. quite openly and freely as yep. side were pitching for business. Whereas the new regulation in recent years is you have to pay for what you see and the conversations you have from buy side to sell side. So an obvious step is. I will just take your friend at UBS with his colleagues in that entire yeah. to equity research team, and I'll just plug them in to the long short equity process of my yeah. hedge fund, and that just houses them. What is basically a taking of one team, just parking them into your infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah.
All right. Well, look, what I'll do is there's a couple of things that if you did enjoy this kind of subject, I don't want to bash Ray Dalio too much because <laughs> there is a video that if you're new to finance, if you just go onto Google and search how the economic machine works. It's very good. So, you know, I did a business management degree when I think back to university. So economics was very lightly touched upon in my my um, academic career. I thought that three or 30 minute video did a better job probably than explaining a lot than those modules that I did at university, to be fair. Yep. And it's all done in an animated cartoon. So it's super digestible, really easy to understand. It's actually really good. And he's got a little series because this is obviously what Ray does now. Uh, it's a content so, yeah. producer. Yeah. I don't like his books for the same reason you don't. But the cartoon explained of how the economy works, they're all really fantastic. The other thing I'd recommend is there's a multi strat fund that we didn't mention called Point 72. Yes. So Point 72 do discretionary, long, short, macro, systematic strategies. So lots of different ones. They have a really good podcast actually called mm. um, How to Become a Hedge Fund Analyst. Yes. So after you listen to our show, <laughs> I would recommend you go and check that out because there's some really interesting conversations and they, they talk you through it. And really that's part of their sales pitch because Point72 do employ also grads. Um, yep. They have something called the Academy that they run, uh, which they hire into. I think it's mainly North America, but yeah, if you're in the States, that's also worth checking out. Um, cool. Piers, thanks very much for your, your time. And uh, no worries. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend.